Voices is brought to you by Squarespace. Everything you need to create an exceptional website. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase, visit squarespace.com and use the offer code MACVOICES6. Welcome to Mac Notables on Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Mac community. I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, last week I had a chance to have dinner with Ted Landau live and in person. This time I've got him not live and in person. It's good to see you, Ted. Well, I'm live, but well, I'm <laughs> right. in, per in person part maybe, but uh, yeah. we're, we're doing this live. I yeah. may not be seen it live, but I'm live when I'm talking to you here. So. Yeah, well, I'm glad that you're live when you're talking hey. <laughs> and, and, and hopefully, uh, I, you know, to your audience viewing this, I don't look two feet shorter than you, as I thought I did last time on the, on the video. So I don't know what accounts for that, whether I was slumping in my seat or some nefarious plot on your part to make everybody look shorter than you. But uh, um, <clears throat> but maybe I'll look a little taller today. I'm not two feet shorter than Chuck, for people who are interested. You're giving me a lot of credit mm, there, Ted, yeah, for a whole lot of editing capabilities mm, that I no, don't possess well, yet. <laughs> uh, well, I, 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 I think you're pretty good. Oh, well, thank you. Thank mm. you. Thank you. So, it was first of all, it was great seeing you last week. Um, you know, we got to spend a little bit of time together in between mm -hmm. sessions at WWDC for you and all mm -hmm. of WWDC for me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably where we should take it, Ted, because that's what everyone is talking about right now. Um, not my wife. Well, not your wife. <laughs> and, and probably three mm -hmm. people that listen mm -hmm. to the show. Yeah, that, that's right. Uh, but other than that, um, and I know, first of all, we should say that you're under NDA. So for, for all the sessions that you went to the show, you can't talk about it. Well, you know, I was thinking, these, uh, are your, these are your listeners. And I could just say, what the hell? Damn the MDA. <laughs> yeah, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Let Apple do what they want. Ban me from all future media events. Sue my ass off. Whatever they want. And then I thought, ah, nah, let's not do that. <laughs> Good, You're, thank you. Yeah. It, well, was, it was it was a thought that occurred to me for a brief moment, and then my sanity restored itself, and that was it. <laughs> well, that's all the time we have tonight, folks. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! So, so having said that, you know, well, I guess we're kind of restricted to the keynote and maybe mm -hmm. just some general impressions. But there certainly was a lot there to the keynote, and I'm I'm curious to see just what you took away from it now that we have a a, a week's worth of perspective. Mm -hmm. Well. It, it largely lived up to my hopes and expectations. That's the best thing I can say. Uh, I was hoping, uh, what was I hoping? Number one, I was hoping that among any possible new hardware, now remember, uh, uh, Tim Cook, I believe, was said not to expect new hardware until the fall. And so that initially led people to say there were going to be no hardware announcements at WWDC. And sort of, he sort of kept to that. Uh, well, except for the MacBook Air refresh, which we can talk about that for a second to get sidetracked. The MacBook Air refresh was a relatively minor thing in the scheme of things that was announced at the Expo, but it's actually receiving more press now because of the increased battery life. It's an astounding battery life. I saw something today that said it had 15 hours of battery life without having to recharge. And that for a laptop, you know, the, uh, the iPad has trouble doing that. For a laptop to be able to do that is truly astounding. <laughs> I think there was an article on the Verge that, that said something like, this is going to be terrible news for all those coffee shops that, that don't have power outlets as a means of discouraging people from sitting all day on a cup of coffee with their laptop. Now they can sit all day anyway, even without the power outlet. Uh, so yeah, I think that I thought that that, that battery life increase is, is significant news for the MacBook Air, and it makes a compelling a MacBook even more compelling. Uh, it doesn't have a retina display, which won't matter for a lot of people. Uh, it matters to me, um, so I'm still happy happy with my Retina Display MacBook Pro, but for anyone that doesn't particularly care whether they have a Retina Display or not and doesn't need the most powerful Mac on the planet, uh, the MacBook Air makes a great Mac. That's it. Enough advertising for Apple there. Um, <clears throat> That, that that said, what did I hope for? I hoped that Apple would have some hardware announcements, uh, despite the promise that nothing would be shown until the fall. And in fact, Tim Cook kept to both things. He did have a hardware announcement, and it isn't going to be available to the fall. So really, both statements uh, are, are true, and that's for the Mac Pro. And the Mac Pro was an astounding 
product from a design point of view. I mean, it's not only not like any other Apple product we've ever seen, it's pretty much not like any other product we've ever seen in terms of design. It looks sort of like uh, uh, R2-D2's nephew or something like that. Uh, it's, it's, this, it's this cylinder, that, and, and the cylinder case, which is smooth except for the part where the port, port's uh, connections are, comes off in case people were wondering. There's a simple little button you can press and then you can just lift the whole case off and get to all the insides. I'm not sure how important it is to get to all the insides because one of the one of the negatives, <coughs> excuse me, one of the things I got as a special gift from WWDC is some illness that I'm recovering from, uh, the typical convention crud that you get. So if you hear me cough from time to time, that's uh, that's why. Uh, there's an example. Uh, <coughs> anyway, um, <coughs> you cannot easily expand the 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 uh, Mac Pro, which in a, which is kind of odd in a way, because that was really what set the Mac, the old Mac Pro, apart from all the other Macs. It was the expandable one. The uh, you know the MacBook Pro with Retina display gets like a zero out of ten from iFixit on 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 repairability and internal access. I mean, I'm exaggerating. I think it was a one out of ten. But but really, you can't add more memory to it. You can you barely can open it. Uh, the Mac Pro, on the other hand, was the paragon of openness. You opened up the door. You had four drive trays. You could put drives in and out. Two optical drive bays. Uh, could add memory, graphics card, PCI chips. Um, Basically, whatever is modifiable on a computer, you could do for the Mac Pro. With the new one, no. Um, you may, you may. Uh, they didn't give a lot of specifics, and I didn't really ask on this. But I'm assuming you'll be able to to modify memory. In fact, <laughs> I'm pretty sure you can. It has. A, uh, uh, I think there's four memory slots with a 32 gigabyte capacity uh, in each slot, so that gives you a lot of memory. Um, <clears throat> but uh, you, there's no PCI slots. There's no drive bays. There's no optical disk base. There's no optical disk or or mechanical hard drive at all. As far as I could tell, it was just an SSD drive. No fusion drive. It's just an SSD drive. And anything you want to do to expand it, be, <laughs> excuse me, beyond, <laughs> excuse me, beyond those basics, uh, you were going to have to do externally, which Apple said would be fine because they're giving you two Thunderbolt 2 ports which are uh, each twice as fast as the initial Thunderbolt which was already very fast. So in terms of throughput, adding external devices isn't going to be uh, much of a negative, at least that's Apple's argument. What I would still be concerned about is both aesthetics and practicality. The aesthetics of having, you know, seven peripherals sitting next side to your Mac, Mac, Mac Pro, as opposed to having them all hidden inside, which makes much more, uh, make, which looks much better from aesthetic point of view, uh, and especially if you have peripherals that each require a separate plug-in. I mean, imagine if you got four hard drives. And each of them were these encased hard drives that have their own power brick and their own uh, requirement to be plugged into a wall outlet. And now you have your MacBook Pro and four hard drives. You now, you now need to plug in five devices, just, uh, ju just whereas with the original Mac Pro, the one that's now going to be discontinued, uh, you would only have to plug in one outlet and put in four internal drives. So that got me thinking that probably the number one most popular accessory for the Mac Pro after it comes out is going to be some sort of docking bay, where you plug the docking bay into a power outlet, and then you can actually slide internal drives into the docking bay, just as if it was uh, the old Mac Pro. And you'll be, and so you'll, with one docking bay, Maybe you'll have a half a dozen docking slots, and you'll be able to put in most of the peripherals that would otherwise be missing from the Mac Pro. Whether, <coughs> excuse me, whether people are happy with that arrangement or not remains to be seen. But I, th I think, <coughs> I think that's the direction things are going to go. Uh, beyond that, it's supposedly super fast, uh, significantly faster than the old, old Mac Pro, and I, and I really like the design. I mean, I really, I really like that Apple is taking uh, some chances uh, and coming up with something that uh, is completely different from the existing product. And go, and I think, and it's, of course, it's significantly smaller than the old Mac Pro, and I think. Uh, and, and I've read some things online that go along with my thinking on this. So, uh, but I, my, my view is that this is an attempt. Backing up a second, you know, one of the things that people were worried about with the long delay to a new Mac Pro is that Apple was going to give up on the Mac Pro market altogether and 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 just kill the product because it had become such a consumer-oriented company. Uh, and I'd hoped, I feared that as well. I wrote a column to, to that effect years ago. 
that that was my concern. Uh, but I hope that wouldn't happen. And I think Apple has struck a sort of compromise with this Mac Pro. Uh, it has the speed and power that Pro users want. Uh, it has an expandability, uh, even if it isn't in internal. It has, a, it has an ability to access the inside of the machine, even if you can't do much with, with it by doing that. Uh, and so it does definitely have some Pro credentials. But at the same time, it isn't such an intimidating machine that, uh, that an advanced non-Pro user uh, might not be attracted to it. They look at it as well, this could actually fit on my desk. You know, it's not that big. And, uh, and it doesn't take up a lot of space with expandability that I'm never going to use anyway. Uh, and so it can appeal to people who, who aren't the pro user. The only thing that might not be appealing in that regard uh, is the price, and that they didn't discuss either. If, if it costs over $3,000 to get a decent decent machine, uh, it's not going to be very appealing to anybody but the pro user anyway. Anyway, um, that's for starters. I know that, that, you know, that isn't everything that happened at WDC, but uh, uh, that was the first thing that struck me. Larry Jordan, the Final Cut Pro expert, uh, has estimated that only about 80% of video professionals actually have uh, a PC I card, you know, a graphics card in their Mac Pros. 80%? 80% do not. Oh, do not. Oh, because there's eighty percent do. All yeah, right, sure. which you know is that kind of throws a bit of a bit of cold water on all the protests that oh we have to have all these all these graphic cards. I, I get the impression with the Mac Pro that Apple once again is pushing everybody forward, just like they did with the original iMac when there was no floppy drive, you know, and there, there's going to be plenty of opportunity to backfill with with, like you say, a breakout box of some kind or a dock. Um, and you mentioned two Thunderbolt ports. Let's not forget the mm. the, uh, the USB 3 ports on the back, mm. which is nothing to sneeze at. Mm, right. right. So, caught up with that, too. Yeah. So, you yeah. know, th there's, just, there's, there's a lot of expandability here. It just hasn't happened to be internal. I agree with your, your comment about the nice breakout box drive bay kind of thing, if people really need it. And the opportunity to, to put it on Thunderbolt, I mean, that should give you all the speed you're going to need. Yeah, I think they said each Thunderbolt port can support up to three displays, three 4K displays, which don't even exist yet for the Mac, uh, which made me think when <laughs> maybe they have a 4K display waiting in the wings for when they announce, uh, when they release this product in the wall. Well, that, I mean, and, and if they can display three 4Ks, how many mm -hmm. regular displays can it support? You, know, mm -hmm. you may be able to line the room with with a normal, a normal yeah, resolution. Uh, yeah, it's going to be able to do some impressive things. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, the design is innovative. Um, I, you know, I hope it works out as well. Certainly, my, they would have checked that by now. I would hope um, with the thermal core uh, yeah. as the heat source or the heat sink. Heat Hopefully, cores. needing less fans and generating less energy than the old ones. Yeah, so there, there's so many things to like here, and I'm but I'm with you. I I am just a little concerned about the price, um, but on the other hand, it is a pro machine, and mm -hmm. it looks like they short of the issue of expandability, and that's not even a compromise. That's just a choice. They have not skimped much, if any, on the design mm -hmm. of this thing and what they're putting in it. Mm -hmm. So, and of course, we don't also don't know what the configurations will be either. Mm -hmm. That's the so idea. it does make me wonder. You know, just listening to you say that, why they took so long not to come out with this. I mean, this was a radical change. I could see why it took so long, but in the interim, why couldn't they have upgraded the current Mac Pro design to include a Thunderbolt port and a USB three? This would not be a time-consuming change on their part. They they do those sort of port upgrades all the time. Why just let the Mac Pro sit until they finally came out with this? And I still don't know, but one thought that was just occurring to me is, well, maybe they wanted to make the old Mac Pro as unattractive as possible. You know, if you had just gotten a Mac Pro six months ago with Thunderbolt and USB 3 ports, and this Mac Pro new one comes out, you might just say, well, I can afford to wait a year or two before I get my new Mac Pro, because I'm very happy with the old one. Uh, but now... Uh, the, the Mac Pros are looking so old in, in, in comparison that if you want to stay current, you're, you're almost being forced to dump your old Mac Pro and get a new one. Yeah, well, I'm not sure. USB 3, I think, would, would be pretty easy, but I'm not sure if there's anything that had to do with the motherboard architecture that would have made Thunderbolt, would have required a redesign. Mm -hmm. That, I, I, don't know. I don't know. I mean, they upgraded the MacBook Airs from not having Thunderbolt to Thunderbolt, and I mean, it, did, it, it didn't didn't seem to require some gargantuan effort on their part. Yeah, that's true too, yeah. 
I don't know. It, it will be interesting to see the price mm -hmm. points and, and what configurations are offered. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. it certainly is an interesting little machine. And yeah. I, I do mean little. That's mm -hmm. that's the other very compelling thing about it. Yeah. yeah. So I guess the next thing is OS X Mavericks. Mm -hmm. um, did you get what you wanted? Yes. Uh, I was pretty happy with that, too, actually. I think that's more of a work in progress than iOS, which we'll get to next. Uh, though, actually, I think both of them are a work in progress. But I think, I actually think we'll see bigger changes to, to the Mac operating system next year than we saw this year. Uh, I, I think they ultimately had to decide where they wanted to make the biggest changes, and they understandably gave it to iOS this year. And uh, they'll still have big changes to iOS next year, I think, too, but they'll have more time to do some big changes to the Mac as well. Uh, but the, the, the number one thing that they did the, in terms of meeting my hopes and expectations is that they didn't continue this march towards what I had called iosification, uh, which I generally used in a negative sense, so there were positive aspects of it as well. Uh, they, they, they no longer seem to be intent on trying to get Mac OS X to work more and more as if it was a non-touchscreen iPhone. Uh, and I consider that to be a good thing. Uh, and not, not only didn't they push in that direction, they seem to be, at least for the moment, backpedaling uh, in a good sort of way. Because, <coughs> excuse me again, uh, one of the things that would happen as you march towards uh, a more iOS-like Mac would be a deprecation of the Finder to the point where one day it would be entirely eliminated because there is no Finder on iOS. And so if you're going to make your Mac be like a, a iOS, get rid of the Finder, depend upon Launchpad, depend upon uh, other things that are like that as, as ways to access your files. You're going to eliminate, you know, if you're ultimately going to eliminate folders anyway uh, as a means of organizing your files, you, you know, it becomes less and less important to have the Finder. Well, that was a concern, but that isn't what they did. In fact, they, what I mean is they went the other way and they beefed up the Finder. They now added tabs to the Finder, uh, and they now um, added um, tags to the Finder as a way of, of organizing your files, both of which I thought were quite cool, and I'm looking forward to using them. Uh, and, and I'm really thinking that tags might finally be the thing that gets me to stop organizing my files primarily by folders. And I might begin to find that I can depend on tags as a way to organize and find my files, uh, which would be nice. <coughs> Had to cough again. Uh, so that so that was good. The the, the expansion of uh, to multiple displays, better support for multiple displays. Not having situations where certain uh, apps launch in full screen and then the second display becomes a gray screen that you can't use for anything. That that sort of thing is going to be largely gone. Uh, so. Um, <clears throat> The um, and the other thing is, uh, and this is a sort of good aspect of iosification, if, which I'm going to stop calling it that since Apple is, is not really pushing that anymore. Uh, but the good part of of, of <laughs> excuse me, some of the iOS related changes is that they are increasingly great ways of getting the devices to be in sync with each other. Uh, the one that, that most attracted me was maps. Now Apple is supplying maps for the Mac, uh, uh, which I think is good in several ways. It makes the maps program more competitive uh, with Google because, well, with Google you could always launch Safari and go to Google Maps. There was no Apple equivalent for that. Now, now there is. There's a separate maps app. Uh, and not only that, but it's integrated with maps uh, on iOS so that if you search for how do I get from my house to the Museum of Modern Art, say, uh, uh, on, your, on your Mac with the Mac uh, version of Maps. Uh, that's great. Now you know how to get there, but you want those instructions with you when you go. Uh, what do you do? Do you print them out, or do you just enter them again on your iPhone when you get in your car, or what? Um, well, now you don't have to think about that, because when you enter it on your Mac in the Maps app, it automatically syncs with Maps on your iPhone, and when you get in your car, it's there waiting for you, ready to give turn-by-turn -turn directions if you want. So I think that, that sort of change, uh, offering iBooks for the Mac, another carryover app from the iPhone to the Mac, excuse me, I think will be similarly uh, welcome. And, and better integration um, with calendar uh, and offering more calendar features than the calendar had before, including, it, <laughs> including it, <laughs> integrating maps with calendar so that uh, you can you can set up, say, I want to be at my doctor's uh, at 3 o'clock tomorrow for an appointment. And it will show you a map of how to get to your doctor's office if you need it, right in the Maps app. So, yeah, there were a lot of really, uh, really good changes. 
Sounds like maybe you need to be at your doctor's tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that, that may be. <laughs> I, I, I was kind of surprised and pleased to see maps for the desktop, map, uh, iBooks for the desktop. There are places where it felt like some of the sacred cows that have been, I, I guess, sort of implied or have now been slaughtered. That you know they're no longer sacred. That there's a lot of parity here. Nobody's threatened by one platform taking from the other. Mm -hmm. it, it just it feels like a much more unified system, and that makes me feel good. That makes me feel mm -hmm. real good about it. The one thing I didn't get that I wanted, um, I haven't, and I've studied the screenshots. I hadn't did not see the colors come back in the sidebars on the final. Uh -huh. oh, yeah. I really want that back. So maybe in the mm -hmm. release version. Uh, maybe not. I don't think. I don't think that's coming. Maybe not. I, I don't think, know. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. But um, so I guess let's see. That I think is it for for Mavericks, and so this takes us to the inevitable discussion of iOS seven. Yeah, I will say one more thing about Mavericks Please. by by the new naming scheme. They've gotten rid of cats. They also think. I don't know whether this will translate into their procedures, but it also means we're not going to see any more of these dual. Uh, cat name where it's lion, mountain lion, leopard, snow leopard. Uh, it's not going to be Mavericks and sort of Mavericks next year or something <laughs> like that. Um, <clears throat> Super Mavericks, whatever. So I think that <coughs> it doesn't really free Apple because Apple was free to do what it wanted anyway, but it, it perhaps will free Apple from this idea that it does a major upgrade for interface one year and then more under the hood interface next year uh and i, I am hopeful that it means that next year we'll we could see you know next i i, I hope it doesn't mean that next year is going to be a less substantial upgrade than this year in terms of new features uh and follow that sort of pattern and they could have a totally new name who knows yosemite could be mac os 10 yosemite or something like that and it could be just as big if not a bigger upgrade than, than this one and, you know, I, I'm sorry, because I, I did want to touch on one mm -hmm. other thing, and that's tags. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen some conflicting reports, and, and obviously I don't have a copy of the beta, so I'm not sure. Have they removed the labels column now in favor of tags? Or? I haven't in installed it, so I don't know. Okay. <laughs> okay. iOS. 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 So, uh, there, there's so much here. I mean, it's it's a, a very different look. Mm -hmm. Um some people have called it, you know, like a candy-fied look. Some mm -hmm. have ta talked about its its readability, that it's over-designed or designed to look great and not, mm -hmm. you know, not be functional. That it looks like the new Star Trek movie. You know, mm -hmm. take your pick. What are your well, reactions? Well, let me put off the talking about the design for a minute and get to the features. And um, it, in that regard, once again iOS largely met my hopes and expectations. In a column that I posted to Macworld just a week before, I talked about how big a change might I expect iOS to have and, I, and how I was hoping that this would be a year for some bold changes to finally um, depart from the way things had been since iOS 1 in many cases. And um, they did that. I mean, some of the things I specifically mentioned in that article, they actually did. It was kind of nice to see. It doesn't happen too often to me. Um, where, they, where they allowed notifications and control center to be launched from the home screen. I think we might have even talked about that on our last show, uh, a home screen change, or maybe it was a conversation we had at WWDC. I don't remember now. Uh, so uh, they did that. They improved how multitasking works, another thing that I talked about. Now you can actually multitask any app, and you have these mini views of the screen uh, rather than that little task bar at the bottom as, as your only indication of multitasking as you swipe through the screens, and I think that's good. The control center itself was something that I had asked for uh, and, and, and gives you quick access to things like changing airplane mode or turning Bluetooth on and off without having to go through the whole rigmarole of finding your settings app. Sorry, I find your settings app uh, and and locating where the Bluetooth setting is in the settings app. So I think that's good. The ability, which I hadn't even thought of, but uh, but another nice thing like that is the ability to go to the search screen from any home screen, rather than having to first return to the top home screen to get to the search screen, which I think was a no-brainer. I don't know why they didn't do that to begin with. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> so, so there are all these feature changes that I think significantly change uh, the way the iPhone works more than almost any other us upgrade that we've had for the last several years, maybe since the very first one. Uh, it, uh, 
it begins to feel, and when you when you throw in finally now the design changes as well, it begins to feel as if Apple were saying, okay, we came out with the iPhone 2007, iPad in 2010, you've had three, six, whatever years to get used to how things work. Nobody is unfamiliar with how a touchscreen works anymore. In fact, probably more people are using a touchscreen every day than, than any almost any other electronic device you can imagine, except for maybe television, I don't know, <clears throat> maybe even that. And and so they said, now, you know, it frees us to do what we want without having to worry about losing somebody because they don't understand the basics. No one's going to look at an iPhone anymore and say, what the hell is that? How does, you know, how does this work? Um, <clears throat> that's not going to happen. So uh, it, 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 it allowed Apple to chart out some new territory. And I think they did a pretty good job of it. Now, in terms of the non-skeuomorphic, ultra-thin font, um, <clears throat> Uh, look itself, I have very mixed feelings about it. Uh, and I am willing to give Apple a sort of semi-pass on my, on my negative feelings while I wait and see how it all sorts itself out. Uh, they might change things between now and the fall anyway. It's not, not written in stone yet. Yeah, as for the control panel design, as opposed to its function, I, I, have not, I was not totally happy with it. I mean, I, I didn't like that the iTunes controls are in the middle of various other settings. Uh, I think that tends to make it harder for, for a function like that to stand out. I think that's something that's separate from the other sort of control settings that you might want and should either have been at the top or the bottom and maybe looked a little different. Uh, and in particular, I, I wasn't super impressed with the whole thin look. Uh, it made it seem like I was looking at some sort of odd Apple II that, that had very minimal graphics power. Um, <clears throat> uh, and, and, they, and they had to have these really simple graphic uh, icons because anything more complicated, the, the, the machine wouldn't be able to support it. Uh, and it looked startlingly different from the home screen that's behind it. And, and so it didn't seem to blend very well with the home screen, which still looks, except for the icon changes, quite similar to, to how it looks in iOS 6. And uh, so, I mean, I, but I think that that's potentially a work in progress aspect. They, they, maybe they'll change the home screen so it's more consistent with how the control panel looks. Uh, maybe they'll flesh out the control panel a little bit more. Maybe they'll decide that the pendulum swang a little bit more in that direction than they really wanted to do, and they'll, and they'll draw back a little bit towards, towards the middle. I don't think they're ever going to go back to making it look like, uh, like things looked before, but uh, I think they can add a little more um, depth uh, and make it not quite so flat as Apple is fond of saying uh, than it is now, and still have what they want. But I think um, overall, I think a lot of it I was happy with. I, I liked the way in which it took advantage of the full screen. You know, a lot of the apps that had borders or, or um, had black rim uh, where it didn't use the screen at all uh, and, and, and focus more on what was in the center, you feel almost like you've gotten a larger screen than you had before, the way a lot of the apps really fill up the screen in a different way. Uh, even when they're not, it, it, because of the way uh, there are less buttons uh, and, and the background just sort of shines through, it feels almost bigger, even when it really isn't, because you have this full screen picture picture in the background uh, with very light text in front of it that gives a, a much more uh, large feeling to, to, the, to the screen. So, and, I, and I like that. And I, I like the redesign of the home screen. Uh, and I like and then the increased access to various features from it. Uh, and I like the way a lot of the apps look once I launch them. Uh, so it's a bit of a mixed, mixed feeling, uh, whether, whether, whether it'll change between now and September or whether Apple will change it in 2014 in response to user criticism uh, remains to be seen. This edition of Mac Voices is brought to you by Squarespace, the beautiful and intuitive website platform that allows anyone to easily create professional web pages, blogs, online stores, galleries, and more in one simple intuitive interface. No matter what your objective, Squarespace can give it a web presence easily. You pick the look of your site from among Squarespace's many templates, then customize it so it looks the way you want, not the way some designer you never met wants. Add pages, your own blog, some photos, and voila, your site is online, ready for your first visitors. Or take just a little more time to connect your social media presences, maybe build a store to help monetize your site, and other niceties that will truly make the site your own. Simple or complex, Large or small, Squarespace is the way to go when you want to build a new website with no muss, no fuss. 
And best of all, you can get 10% off your first purchase just by visiting squarespace.com and using the offer code MACVOICES6. Whether you're ready to buy immediately or want to use their 14-day trial, be sure to go to squarespace.com and use the offer code MACVOICES6 to take 10% off your first purchase, no matter how large or small. Squarespace, everything you need to create an exceptional website. Thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this edition of Mac Voices. How about the the parallax for the home screen? That the that your wallpaper or your your background photo mm-hmm. appears to be you know deep in the in the iPhone. Mm-hmm. It's a nice little piece of eye candy. I'm not sure it really is is that enhances the function, but it certainly is something that you're going to want to show off to your friends who don't have iPhones and say, you know, look at this, isn't this cool? Yes, I'm sure you will. And I'm sure they'll say, who cares? <laughs> uh, uh, <clears throat> but, uh, but yes, I, I don't think it serves a immediate practical function. But I was reading something today, I think, from a link from Daring Fireball uh, that was saying that, that was one of several changes to iOS that were more um, motion dependent, that there were, you know, the physics engine had been improved to allow gravity dependent actions to, to f- function in a different sort of way. Uh, the compass had changed to allow that, that leveler um, to exist in the middle of the compass. And, and in various ways, Apple was giving the iPhone increased motion related capabilities of which the parallax view could be considered an example. And uh, I think the sense was that Apple, this is just the beginning, that Apple is moving the iPhone to be a much more motion-sensitive device, uh, whereas in the beginning it was primarily, you primarily interacted with it uh, with by moving your finger across the screen, uh, and then increasingly there were ways to interact with it with just your voice alone. Uh, and now increasingly you'll find ways to interact with it just by tilting the machine or waving something at the machine or, or whatever. And and uh, I think that is a direction that Apple is likely to be going. Uh, to some extent, uh, there are some Samsungs that, in my view, not very effectively have that waving already. Um, uh, but I, I think, and hopefully in a better way, that's something that Apple will be working on. Mm-hmm. Which, again, brings me to my overall biggest reaction to iOS 7, which is that it is a beginning. It's not an end. Uh, this is the iOS in which, for the first time since 2007, they broke ranks and said, we're not going to be tied to doing anything in the iPhone the way, in a certain way because that's the way it was always been done. Everything is up for grabs. Here's the changes we've made, and there's some big ones. But that doesn't mean that they're done. It's not like now Now we can go back to minor changes for the next six years and we'll have some big changes again in 2019 or something like that. Uh, I think we, we can expect to see a continuing evolution of that beginning so that two or three years from now, the iOS will be even more startlingly different uh, from what, what iOS 7 is today as iOS 7 is from iOS 6. One, one other announcement that doesn't seem to have been talked about much, I don't think, and that is that they made a point of saying that Siri's getting smarter, that, mm-hmm. that he, she, it, whatever, um, can respond to a lot more commands that mm-hmm. we have. And, 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 of course, they just showed a few. You know, they're going right. to do more. It has and, Wikipedia built into it. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's really encouraging because I think this is, a, this is one, of the, one of the ways of the future. I'm, I'm with you. iOS 7 represents a new beginning. Um, and if, if Siri can become a much more important part of the interface, a, a more rel- a much more reliable part of the interface, that's going to answer a lot of the critics that say Google has a leg up in this area. Mm-hmm. And, cer- and certainly Apple seems to be harnessing the computing power necessary. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, in that regard, for me, a big thing is the ability of Siri to stay inside Siri as opposed to going to Safari to show an answer. Because, uh, you know, frankly, I've had trouble getting myself to use Siri on a regular basis. Like, if I, if I want to know, um, you know and this happened just the other day, if I want to know what's happening, say, in a Giants game or the play or the, the, uh, the, the San Antonio Spurs Miami Heat playoffs or something like that, which I'm following, <clears throat> I would typically launch Yahoo Sports, one of the apps I have on my iPhone, and pull the refresh, and it would show me the latest scores and what's happening. Uh, and then it occurred to me, well, you know, maybe I can 
use Siri to do this. So I said, you know, so I just say, what's the latest score in the Spurs Heat game or something like that? And not only did it do it, uh, or I, actually I remember more distinctly for a basketball game where I asked something about the results in a Giants game. And it showed me, you know, the, the nine inning box score, a simplified graph, uh, posted some highlights, and did it all within Siri, so that I was still in Siri uh, and, and could easily retreat back to whatever app I was using before without having to have it go to Yahoo and launch some third-party sports page to, uh, to, to, to get the results. And so the more that it does that, the more I will be encouraged uh, to use Siri. So I think that's big, too. And, and Apple did promise that that was going to happen a lot more in iOS 7, which is why I mentioned it. Ted, how about just the overall feel of, of this keynote? Um, I, I can't decide whether it's my imagination or whether it seemed like there was a lot less tension. I'm not sure if it's because um, uh, Federighi made money, did the demos for the iOS and Mac OS mm-hmm. announcements, but it didn't feel like things were being pulled in different directions. This just felt like a much more unified Apple than we've seen in a little while. Maybe because of some of the overrides between Mavericks and iOS 7. I don't know, but it just that that was my takeaway from it. And it seems to have gotten very positive reviews across the board. How how did you see it? Yeah, I I I I believe that you're onto something there. I, I mean I think immediately after Steve Jobs died. There were two problems that Apple was facing. One was, and there were related problems, one was how do you do something without inevitable comparisons to Steve Jobs, without people saying, that's not how Steve would have done it, and you're doing it worse, being the implication, not that you're doing it better. Uh, And the other related thing is how do you get out of the shadow of Steve Jobs? What if you wanted to do something that Steve Jobs would not have wanted to do uh, because you think is actually better or perhaps because it just is something that came up after Steve Jobs died and Steve Jobs never got a chance to offer his opinion on it. Uh, and and how, do you, how do you begin to stake out your own territory and make Apple something that isn't uh, Steve Jobs' Apple, but is Tim Cook's Apple or, or somebody else's Apple? Uh, and so I think those are both problems that, App, that Apple and the executives faced after Steve died. And this was the first keynote that I felt really represented that. There, here was a keynote that said, um, we're comfortable now doing what we want to do without worrying about comparisons to Steve Jobs. Uh, and this, this is the direction we're taking Apple, and this is our direction. This is what, this is what Johnny Ive wants to do. This is what Tim Cook wants to do. This was, you know, and, and whether or not it's what Steve Jobs would have wanted to do is not a primary consideration anymore. May, in a general sense, in terms of the mission of Apple, I'm sure it is, but in terms of the specifics, not so much anymore. You know, the other feeling I got was that, and, and I haven't necessarily had this feeling before, but looking back, I, I guess I'm ascribing mm. the, this feeling, that there was a sense of, of loss, of, of a time of mourning, a mm-hmm. time of bereavement, that Apple had mm. to move forward, but it was kind of struggling ahead and mm-hmm. you know, putting one foot in front of the next and, and moving forward. Mm-hmm. This time, it seemed very light, very upbeat, um, Again, Federighi just did an amazing job. Whether his jokes and and all those things were mm-hmm. were practiced or whether they were legitimate, he mm-hmm. recovered from every single one beautifully. Got some laughs, you know. Mm-hmm. Had a lot of oohs and ahs. I mean, mm-hmm. it just felt good. It felt like you know we're back out in the sunshine where we should mm-hmm. be. Mm-hmm. And I have to say, I mean, this is this is the third, I think, WWDC I've attended. I don't go every year for various reasons. I may never go again, actually, the way things are going now with your ability to get tickets. I lucked out and got a ticket this year, and probably, even if I wanted to, probably won't get a ticket again. Um, <clears throat> but this was the first one when I could really attend it as an attendee, in the sense that in the past I was always attending as a representative of Mac Observer, or some other website. Um, or, and I spent a lot of my time getting interviews, writing reaction articles, and so on. And that meant that I had very little time to sit and listen to sessions. Uh, and this was the first one where I could go to every session I wanted to go to and, and, must, and probably attended, I don't know, more certainly more than a dozen, maybe several dozen sessions by the time it was over. <clears throat> and uh, I was super impressed. Uh, I was improving. They every session I attended had a different 
Apple engineer or combination of several Apple engineers that appeared during the talk, and they were all relatively polished. Not all necessarily spectacularly great, but they all spoke well. Uh, they had a good stage presence, a little bit of a sense of humor. I mean, Apple, and I'm sure this can't just be coincidence. You don't get a bunch of engineers in particular. You, know, you don't have 50 or 100 engineers show up for a conference and all of them speaking well uh, and capable of presenting a performance that Apple could be happy having on video that anybody could see. Uh, so, I mean, kudos really to Apple. And of course, then they open up those labs uh, where, where engineers, I walked into them, and again, people walk right up to me and say, you know, can I help you? Is there some problem that you need help with? I mean, Apple does a fantastic job of, of hosting this conference, and, and my hat is off to them in that regard. It's it's so good to hear because there was so much criticism about the way the tickets were distributed, how many tickets there were, the fact that you know there weren't a lot more, and the demand obviously far outstripped the the ability of Apple to provide sessions for. So the fact that you actually got to attend WWDC and came away with that kind of positive reaction that that says so much. And what what was the number Cook gave? Um, about how many new developers there were there, or how many first-time attendees, some ridiculous amount, 50, yeah, 60, uh, 70 yeah, percent? There were, well, he asked for a raise of hands how many were attending for the first time, and a large number of people raised their hands. I mean, it's a whole different ballgame with iOS. You know, compared, uh, if it was just the Mac, the number, the number of iOS developers so far outstrips the number of Mac developers right now that uh, you, know, you get the impression that anybody with $99 a, and a uh, driver's license applies for iOS. Uh, developer status. Uh, so uh, there, there, there is a many, many more than can possibly attend. Probably a lot of them would never want to, want to attend in terms of the money involved. So it could, it could be expensive. You have, not only do you have the $1,600 of the, of the conference itself, but if you're coming from out of town, you have travel expenses, hotel expenses, food expenses, unless you have some company that's paying for you to go, which I'm sure some of them did. Uh, it can be quite expensive, and so, uh, <clears throat> but still, there are a lot more people that wanted to attend uh, than could attend. There's no doubt about it, and that is a problem that Apple has to deal with going forward. But I don't know what the best solution is. I, mean, the, I can't see them making the conference twice as large because it wouldn't be the same conference. Uh, it just they just can't do it there, and. So the, the question is, do they make it into some totally different sort of conference and lose some of the advantages of the current WWDC to accommodate more people, um, or do they, excuse me, or do they change the way people get tickets uh, in a way that makes more people feel satisfied that they got a chance to get a ticket? I mean, there's something a little bit strange at, at of, uh, uh, of tickets going sold out in 70 seconds. Uh, I mean, rock concerts maybe <laughs> do that. Book of Mormon maybe. You know, you can expect something like that to happen. Uh, but any, and even there, you probably have a better chance of getting tickets than you did for WWDC. So um, <clears throat> it, it is a bit weird. And, and you'd like to think that your chances of of getting a ticket don't don't, uh, don't depend on simply how fast you can click your trackpad. But uh, but there you have it. You you got to spend the the, the week at mm. WWDC. I got to spend a few days at Alt WWDC, which was really a fascinating experience. It's the first time I've had a chance to be up close and pers personal with a bunch of developers in an environment where they were interacting sort of on their own terms, not for the benefit of somewhere someone else, mm -hmm. like MacWorld, uh, MacWorld iWorld, where they're you know they're really there to talk to the public and talk to the users. Mm -hmm. Here they're talking among themselves, and it it I gained a new respect for developers um, for what they go through. But well, what was your old respect? Well, my old respect was that they seriously. I mean, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know that they put a lot of effort into it, but. There are times that you look at certain apps and think, "Wow, really? You know, wh why why would they even build this thing?" Mm -hmm. I came away with just realizing that n I guess what I should have realized before that th these people all have just this amazing passion for this platform. Their their apps may or may not be the most sophisticated things. Um, there are indie developers out there who are, are are living on one or two apps, the revenue from one or two apps, and are really working hard at, at making mm -hmm. those apps good. Um, and they don't have to be in the top 10, 20. Mm -hmm. You know, they they seem to be very comfortable. But it didn't matter what where they ranked or what mm -hmm. kind of app it was. 
they were just intent on building the best thing possible. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I, I congratulate Judy and, and uh, Rob and Kyle for the terrific event they put on. Mm-hmm. But I also congratulate the developer community, the people that didn't get the tickets but still made the trip to San Francisco, mm-hmm. even though they just got to sit around the corner, you know, <laughs> in, in a different conference and then go to some of the parties and interact outside. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, you know, when I think of iOS developers in particular, it's sort of like blog bloggers, or in your case, podcasters, where you know not everyone that writes a blog is going to wind up being like the Huffington Post. Uh, there are lots of people that are going to write blogs, uh, even if they're meant for a wide audience. Now, some people write blogs just for their relatives, but uh, but even if you're trying to get a wide audience, you'll you'll never get more than a few hundred, or maybe at most a few thousand people reading reading your blog. But that doesn't. But a lot of those people spend a lot of time trying to make it a really good blog anyway. Very professional. Uh, a lot of good writing goes on on some of those blogs. Some of them can be crappy, but a lot of them are quite good. And I think it's the same thing with the apps, that, that yes, it may be that some of those apps are never going to make a ton of money. People aren't going to be able to retire to, 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 to Hawaii and, and, and live the rest of their life on a beach on their app, app revenue. Uh, but they still uh, find it enjoyable to push and make the app as good as it can and, and has a modicum of, of popularity, hopefully, that, that makes it worthwhile. That's a great analogy. Um, I wouldn't have made it, but I think it's a great analogy that it, they just they want to do it good. They, they're doing it more for themselves than to make money. I mean, sure, they have to eat. Everybody mm-hmm. has to eat. But, you know, it, it's, it, it's just the, the sense of pride and, and intensity that I got mm-hmm. from pretty much everyone I ran into. And whether I interviewed them or not, the same thing came through. Um, and, and even game developers, which – Again, I'm not a gamer, and so I've I've never taken games quite maybe as seriously as I mm. as I will now, mm-hmm. because of the uh, again of the intensity and the interest and the the mm-hmm. love that these people have for their apps. So, mm. to all the developers out there, good job. I don't care whether you're WWDC or Alt WWDC or whether you had to sit at home and watch the video. Mm-hmm. You guys have my respect. Well, they've, they've, they've had mine as well. And it does, you know, I, I do think about the difficulties that app developers have getting their apps noticed. And, and I'm, I'm a prime example of someone they would have problems with in that maybe there, there are some cases I can imagine worse than mine, but I'm close to a worst case scenario in the sense, in, in the sense that I have acquired hundreds of apps over the over the last six years of the iPhone's existence. I have an app that does just about everything that I want an iPhone app to do. You know, the, it isn't like I wake up in the morning and say, I wish there was an iPhone app that could do X, and maybe I can find one if I go to the app store. And basically, there isn't anything like that. And maybe there's an X that I don't know about you know, that, that I'd be glad to have if, if I knew it existed, but, but I, I'm not thinking about it. And so I don't really go looking for new apps. Uh, and so hundreds of new apps could come out over the next month or two, and unless they got a lot of publicity, uh, you know, unless the Mac Observer or Macworld had, had prominent articles reviewing them and talking about them or something like that, um, I'd never know about them. And, and so once you get into a position like mine, uh, I think it becomes hard to get people to look at your apps. Uh, a lot of the people that are looking at apps are people that are, you know, just got their iPhone uh, last month or something. That that's an audience that you can still appeal to, but the entrenched user like myself can be really hard to reach, and I'm not sure how you do that. No, and and not only are you entrenched, but you also are a bit jaded, as am I, mm-hmm. and as are a lot of our friends, because you wake up in the morning and you just you get inundated with press releases, and they all mm-hmm. you know they all have the same spin. This is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. But you know, I've got I've got to try to sort out the wheat from the chaff somehow, at, mm-hmm. at, at least at what I'm going to look at, and then mm-hmm. what I what I may cover here or or elsewhere. And you have to do the same. So it it is a big problem. But again, I just with the people that attended this conference, you know, these are not just mm-hmm. slapped together and mm-hmm. see if I can hit you know hit a bunch of people for ninety nine cents. It it really is a labor of love. 
which is not expensive. That's another thing that drives me crazy. People that say, oh, I don't know, it's not free. I'm not going to, is it really worth 99 cents? Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. if, if there's a chance you're going to like it, uh, yeah. you, you spend more than 99 cents to get water, <laughs> 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 which you could get out of the tap. You know, if you've ever bought a bottle of water, you've spent more than 99 cents out of it unnecessarily. You could have just gone to a tap instead. So, I mean, it's really 99 cents is, is nothing for, for, for a decent app. So, and I will say, and something you said triggers in my mind. The iPhone itself remains something that I marvel at every day when I get up in the morning. It just I never tire of, of being amazed by it, uh, and I never stop being amazed by it. If, if, if I could go back in time, say 50 years, 100 years, and somebody said I could only bring one thing with me to show me what, to show those people 100 years ago what the current technology is like, there's no doubt in my mind it would be an iPhone, maybe an iPad, but probably an iPhone. And uh, I mean, assuming, of course, that if I went back in 100 years, it would still work like it does today, even though there's no in internet 100 years ago. Uh, but if it actually could work, magically work like it works here, um, that's what I would bring back. Because there's nothing that I can imagine that would more knock somebody's socks off than looking at, at all the things that you can do with an iPhone. There's a zillion devices in one that replaces so many other things that were bigger, bulkier, less competent. Uh, and and it's, it, it's like, it's, I, I, it's what I say to people, I said, when you have an iPhone, it's like living in the future. It's, it's like you read a science fiction novel and what you read actually came to exist. There it is. The, the, what, people, what people said would happen someday is happening now. And it's just amazing. If you had gone back that hundred years and shown them the yeah. iPhone, you'd have been burned as a witch. Yeah, yeah. Or something like that. Or well, so. I, mean, I don't think they were doing that a hundred years ago. But, uh, it was still a 20th century a hundred years ago, but maybe in some countries. Right. But yeah. at least in the United hundred years ago in the United States, uh, I don't think they were burning people as witches. But yeah. maybe they were. Maybe, <laughs> maybe if they saw that, they might have been. That's, that, that's right. <laughs> Well, Ted, thanks for the uh, for the WWDC wrap up. It's it's fun. It was great to see you, and you know, hopefully, oh, yeah. we can now with doing yeah. the video, we can see each other a little more, uh, so mm -hmm. that you look a little smaller here than in per in person. But yeah, yeah. Well, how are you doing that exactly? <laughs> That's what I was getting at before, and Chuck probably looks ten times bigger. That's it. But there you go. <laughs> Ted, we'll talk to you again soon. I'm actually 6'8". Uh, <laughs> Chuck just makes me look small. Yes, yeah, so it's all my fault. It's all That's my fault. Right. That's mm. right. Thank you, Ted. Oh, thank you. It's fun as always, and I'll look forward to doing it again next time. Sounds good. Yeah. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. He's Ted Landau. This is Mac Notables on Mac Voices. We will be back again soon. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Bye. Visit macvoices.com for links, show notes, to subscribe, to connect with Chuck on Twitter, app.net, Google+, Facebook, and for more Apple, Mac, and tech-related shows, including Mac Voices, Mac Notables, the Mac Jury, and the Mac Voices Briefing. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com.